Welcome back to the Slow Flower Show with Deborah Prinzing, episode 562. Well, we are closing in on the 2022 Slow Flower Summit, taking place June 26th to 28th in Westchester County, New York, at two venues, the Red Barn at Maple Grove in Bedford and at Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture in Pocantico Hills, and they're both in New York, just outside of Manhattan. You've met almost all of our speakers here on the Slow Flowers Show or the Slow Flowers Podcast, and tickets are nearly sold out with sales closing June 18th. I'm so grateful to everyone who has shared their passion and knowledge at past Slow Flower Summits, which our community has enjoyed both in person as attendees and through our numerous Slow Flowers channels. Today, I've pulled video from floral artist Susan McCleary's opening demonstration at the 2021 Summit held last summer in the San Francisco Bay Area at Filoli Historic House and Garden. Based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Sue is an award-winning floral designer known for her unique boundary-pushing floral art. She is the founder of Passion Flower, a floral design company that offers workshops online and around the world. We invited Sue to teach on the 2021 Slow Flower Summit stage and also to give our keynote presentation. Today, I'm sharing her design demonstration of a large-scale, foam-free botanical presentation. In this encore video, you'll watch the entire demonstration and learn Sue's exact techniques and mechanics, as well as how she prepares her famous burrito as an alternative to foam, what types of ingredients she selects, and how she uses principles of design to achieve pleasing proportions and balance and beauty in her final work of art. Let's jump right in and meet Susan McCleary. I'll share our sponsor thank yous at the end. Thank you for being here, Sue. Thank you for having me. Like my friendship with Max, I count my relationship with Sue McCleary a highly enriching one. We first met in 2014 through Holly Chapel at the Chapel Designers Conference in New York, where I caught my first glimpses of Sue's intricate botanical jewelry. Little did either, either of us know that six years later, Sue would author her first book, The Art of Wearable Flowers, and she would ask me to write the foreword, which was such an honor. Tomorrow, Sue will kick off our day of presentations with her keynote presentation, and it's called The Creative Journey, Finding Your Artistic Voice, Truth, and Expression. Today, she's welcoming, welcoming us into her world of large-scale, foam-free botanical installations, You'll learn Sue's approach to elevated design and watch closely some of her favorite techniques that she'll share about how to use mechanics and keep things sustainable. Um, Sue has been assisted in getting ready for this uh, by both Toby Nelson and Lisa Wad, and they may be in and out. Um, both are past some speakers, and so we're keeping it in the family. Uh, but for now, um, I just want to welcome Sue McCleary. Thank you so much for being here, Thank Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, because not everything that was rescheduled for this year included the same lineup. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm happy that you kept me in the back burner and brought me back out. So <laughs> hi, everybody. So many friends, so many people that I love are here. So very happy to be here. Um, like Deborah said, uh, we met years ago. Um, I started as a florist by mistake. I think a lot of florists do. Um, I was making intricate uh, jewelry for friends that were getting married. And one friend had me making her bridesmaids jewelry and hadn't hired a florist and pretty much said like, oh, S word, I don't have a florist. You're creative, could you try to do this? So um, I said yes, but I didn't feel um, that excited, frankly. I just thought this will be a fun little thing to try out. Um, but when I was designing her flowers, I had like the most ridiculous grin on my face the entire time, kind of like what Max said. Um, I hadn't eaten, I hadn't slept. I was smoking cigarettes because I was like trying to stay awake. Um, but, but I recognized uh, a unique feeling and that is curiosity and enthusiasm. And when they merge, um, I think that's when we're being told that we have to make a move um, towards pursuing something that's really special. So, oh, I feel choked up. <laughs> okay, I'm kind of a cornball, so you're gonna, you're gonna hear more tomorrow about that. <laughs> but anyway, I really recognized there was something there, something very special. Um, 
emerging of the love and reverence for the natural world uh, with design and working with my hands, which I find really, really satisfying. So um, I began my, my journey into floristry and started doing lots of weddings um, and then found, again, that feeling when curiosity, enthusiasm merge and tell you something needs to be explored, I started to teach. And it's not because I'm good at public speaking. <laughs> um, it's because I couldn't deny the love I have for the craft. Um, for florists, who I feel like are just starting to be recognized as artists. Do you know what I mean? Um, for growers who work so hard to bring all of these beautiful little sentient beings to our uh, hands. Um, I think it all is very special and very important. It's not serious, but it's very important and special, I think. So um, anyway, after uh, kind of pursuing my love of um, the little like wearable things, because it's so aligned with my jewelry and fashion love, um, I became um, more interested in, in large-scale design. So I kind of have these two focus, foci, focus, well, you know what I'm saying. Um, the teeny tiny and then the big. Um, I do centerpieces too, but you know, those are my two things. So um, I, the first thing I fell in love with is corsages. So I, because I had the jewelry background, I thought, um, I recognized that there was this pain point in floristry. There's this notion that corsages are, you know, not cool, um, that they shouldn't even be done, you know, that uh, just sell them a bouquet instead. Like, I kept hearing all of these things, um, and that, like, piqued my curiosity. And I thought, you know, I've got this jewelry love, and now I have this floral love, and I want both of them to um, fuse. So I started pushing out the idea that corsages could be unexpected and creative and artful and, and pleasurable to make. Um, when I started uh, being asked to teach large-scale design, a similar thing went through my head. So what are the pain points that florists have? What are my frustrations with this work? How do I wish it was different? Um, and shortly after teaching uh, large-scale design a little bit on my own, I was asked to teach for Florette um, for three of her workshops. And her uh, people that come are um, flower farmers. So they aren't interested in anything that isn't sustainable. So I had to think through, and it was a really great exercise for me, think through how can I create things that are artful and impressive and serve, you know, uh, perform for the length of time they need to perform for, but yet are uh, sustainable. So I think about uh, large scale design as a corsage for the room. Okay, so it, right? That kind of makes sense. Or a crown for the room, what have you. Um, because they're asked to do the same thing. They're typically asked to arrive at the party just in time, look good for the length of the event, and then they don't go home with anybody, typically, <laughs> right? So, like, people are weird, and, you know, they'll take a centerpiece with the rented vase and they'll cart it off, but they're not going to start taking this apart. They're not going to go to the wedding arch, and typically. Um, not going to, you know, take down the ceiling installation. You know, they're going to take what they can, <laughs> but they're not going to take these guys. So, I feel like um, what they're being asked to do, it has, has limits, which I enjoy. I'm kind of rigid in that way. I like, I like limits. I like to know what, what needs to be done. So this guy, uh, there will be a window of time, you know, that you have to set it up. So that, that has to be reasonable. The mechanics have to work for that. Um, you can't do everything on site. You have to be able to do things ahead of time. As we all know, there's limited time as a florist. Um, the flowers have to be supported. So you have to choose your materials wisely. Um, Always in my head, I'm thinking of how can I make this more pleasurable, pleasurable for myself? How can I make this work not crazy making? And how can I enjoy the process? And how can I uh, create as little waste as possible? So for me, large scale design is either reusable, uh, reusable, reusable, <laughs> um, or compostable. So, um, yeah, and please ask questions, because it's more fun that way, and I don't feel like I'm talking so much, although I already have 
said a lot. Okay, so um, chicken wire is my go-to. So for wearables, I love to wire, I love hand wiring. For wearables, glue is my go-to because I have freedom, I have design freedom, I don't have to be worried about um, you know, how to combine, how to get things to stay right where I want them. With large scale design, chicken wire is my go-to. And uh, it's kind of funny because there's so many new florists that I talk to and they're like, how, how, how? And I was like, chicken wire, chicken wire, chicken wire. It's so silly, but it is chicken wire that allows a lot of things to happen, okay? It's as simple as that. <laughs> um, so I'll show you what I call a burrito. This is the fun part, guys. Um, I will say that I didn't really know how a lot of things were created until, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years ago. And then I started freelancing for some really big events, and I saw some really substantial um, installations and started to poke around behind the installations to see like what was going on in there. And I've left these naked, half naked, for you guys to see as well. So this is not um, an idea that is individual to my uh, creation. This is um, adapted from what I observed. I took the pieces that made sense to me and I tried to tweak the pieces that didn't make good sense to me to um, create a system that allows me to do what I need to do uh, with little waste. So hopefully it's useful to you. And I always like to say, just fold, fold this into what you're already doing. Borrow from it. If you already know it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe ask another question um, that gets you some good nuggets out of this. Um, but here we are. This is the burrito. So I roll out my chicken wire. This is somewhat flimsy. I usually use florist grade chicken wire, which this is, but the one I get is a little bit more substantial and it is plasticized, which is kind of yucky, but you're using it again and again and it prevents rust. So I do, I do feel okay about that. And then I'm looking for anything that I have in my compost pile, in my backyard, um, maybe greens from the week before, something like uh, Smilex if you have it, or grapevine, just something that's not going to get mushy and yucky uh, in the burritos. You can call it a sushi, you can call it a Swiss roll, you can call it, you know, whatever you like. The reason why I'm doing this, and this is an ad adaptation to the original chicken wire structures I observed, um, I felt like the chicken wire, I would see people making these like hollow forms out of chicken wire and then you're trying to design efficiently and quickly and the things are sagging and flopping around because there's nothing inside to hold them in place. So you need a few like layers of the hex in the chicken wire so the stem can go through and really get locked in place. I add to it with this stuffing of the burrito so there's this matrix of stems inside um, that the stems really hold on to. And you'll feel it when you're trying to put everything in the compost <laughs> the next day. You really got to get in there. It's really reliable. So anyway, so I line my, my burrito and I roll it up like this. And then I cinch it shut. I usually use fine wire. You can use zip ties if you like, harder to reuse. Um, and then these guys, I make them whatever shape, whatever size, whatever length, whatever fullness, um, whatever rigidity I need to create, whatever form I'm trying to create. And then I use them again and again. So I have burritos that are quite old. They've been with me a long time. Um, and I just put them in the, you know, the crazy corner you have in your studio. <laughs> And then I've got like all sorts of different shapes and sizes and I can combine them and attach them for whatever I need to do. So after you have your burrito, the next thing you need, you can call it whatever you like, you don't have to call it burrito. Whatever, um, whatever you're being asked to do, you can attach this. So this can be, this can be a, a runner that cascades down a table and you can design right into it. Um, it can be a banister, okay? Um, I like to uh, like weave in steel rods quarter inch steel rods and then I can you know create these these round dynamic lines um, and it stays rigid because there's that steel rod kind of um, spine in there keeping it rigid so this really can allow you to create all sorts of things anything you want to create 
Um, it can be, you know, a hat. It can be <laughs> whatever you need. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll talk more about it with this. So I don't have steel rods here at Filoli, but I do have this rustic wire. So when I want to create like a crescent, like let's say I have to do like a half moon, a hanging half moon, or um, you know those like wedding nooks that are kind of like a C shape, um, I'll roll out the chicken wire and then I'll fold it in on itself. And that's what I have now just wire that I've folded in this way. And then on one end, I take a quarter inch steel rod that I get at a metal supply store. They're like 10 feet long, you know, six, eight, 10, they come like that. You can get them cut two to size. And then I weave it through one side, creating this rigid border. And then I stuff my envelope as full as I want. So if I want a really tall C-shaped thing, I'll stuff it with lots of big, you know, branchy things. Um, and then close the envelope, and then I take my other steel rod and I weave it in the other side. So I have this little envelope. I'll do it. A little envelope that I can um, create, you know, the half moon shape. And then that becomes my internal structure. The exciting thing, there's so many exciting things about this topic, but um, one of the exciting things is you can um, really reduce the amount of materials you need to use because you have like this big, you know, form inside and you're just adding the, ice, the icing layers to this big form. So instead of, you know, depending on so many stems of um, materials, you have this little like internal form that just needs to be, um, coated with icing. Yeah, for like a, um, in the ground. Yeah, yeah, you would like stake it down. I mean, it really depends on the needs of the event. You know, like where will it be placed? But you definitely need reliable attachment points. So after you've created these forms, you know, the next thing is, do I have a weight bearing structure that's reliable that I can hang this from. So, you know, those things are very important. And that's why it's so important to do site visits because you have to know what, um, what you're dealing with. If people ask questions, would you repeat the question before you Oh, sure. Them? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Okay, so pretend this is stuffed. And then I take the two ends and I join them. And then I make my, my C structure. So this would be a steel rod that you would attach with something hefty, and then this would be full of green. But then I can, this is a model. This, this, I would not make something so tiny, right? <laughs> you guys are with me, right? OK. <laughs> it's like a, a Barbie canoe or something. <laughs> OK, so these are steel rods. This is like 10 feet long, <laughs> and then stuffed with hardy greenery. And then you have your, your half moon structure. And then from here, you would design directly into the chicken wire. So now I'm going to ask you to be OK with a few things and let me know how you feel. I like the conversation, so please speak up. What I'm going to ask you to be OK with is designing largely water-free. It depends where you live. So there's, I think, four contributors to wilt, uh, heat, light, Aridity, you know, low humidity, um, heat, light, humidity. There's one more. Temperature. Temperature. Thank you. Yeah, so these flowers need to perform for their event, but we control, like, what we use. We decide what materials we use. We decide based on, you know, the needs of the event and the um, environment of the, of the event. So I realize talking you know, me in Michigan <laughs> to floors all over the world about this is a little bit hard for people to uh, swallow sometimes because, you know, I'm not designing in 20% humidity, 110 degrees. I'm just not. I'm designing in 40% humidity and 86 degrees, you know? Um, so I, 
I, I'm challenging people to think about what performs well in your environment. So you observe your environment every day. Um, so like here, for instance, the, um, the live oak, it's dry. It's so like, it, it's so leathery and strong and you can tell that it's okay without water all of the time. So when you cut it, um, it's gonna have like a day, two days, three days. It might have weeks where it still looks the same because it's leathery and hardy and it's not needing a lot of um, moisture. But the abelia definitely needs a water source. So I'm not gonna try to ask too much of, of, of this abelia. I know what it needs. Um, the live oak I would design right into the chicken wire structure without any water source at all. And I would feel good that that would be okay for the length of the event, for, the, for what I'm asking it to do. So um, I'm choosing my materials. So I have this whole uh, list of reliables, I call them. And I'm coming, I have one now, it's on my Instagram menu. If you wanna check it out, the link menu, it's there for you to um, check out and I'm adding to it. Um, but what I try to do is design ahead of time so I'm not made too crazy, you know, before the event. And I try to uh, lay in my first at least three floral layers with things that are reliable. So I usually start with a green because that's something we commonly do. So I would layer in a green into the structure first and then I would go in um, starting to add some color with either textural cascading layers like uh, privet berry or pepper berry or something like that. And then I would go in with yarrow and add you know, a kind of backdrop of color and then at the event, I would start adding in my focal flower layers. So yesterday, um, I laid in the abelia. Knowing it needed a water source, I used these extra large water tubes that I get through Mayesh. Um, I don't think all water tubes are created equal. This one is five inches long and it has enough water um, to last, you know, the length of an event. I'm not a fan of using 300 little tiny water tubes in a structure because I, if, it go, if it is up for any length of time, that water's gone and it's just so much time and so much effort. So I love these guys. So if I am using delicate materials, I'll use something like this. I'll use installation mechanics. This is a new one. This is Syndicate Sales. Um, Holly Chapel's installation line. So this, this is like the equivalent of, I don't know, 30 water tubes, something like that. So these get attached in two installations. Then you can add your delicate materials in there. Um, Ecofresh wraps, flower diapers. So you wet this and then you make your um, cluster of flowers and you lay them in there. You fold them up and you have this little, this is wet, okay, you're with me? And then it goes in a, a baggie, a little compostable baggie, and then you can attach that into the installation. I'm also a big fan of something, I'm calling the hydration chamber. This is not, again, original to me. I've just been testing it a lot. Um, working with people like, or learning from people like Gregor Lersch and Hitomi Gilliam, um, water from the outside in is a huge uh, transformative technique. So. What I mean by that is you get your flowers in or you cut your flowers from your, your um, you know, cut your flowers and then you condition them like normal. So they drink through their stems for at least a day. The following day, you can design your pieces. So your corsage, your wearable, your sections of large scale installation and then spray them liberally with water and then put them in an enclosed um, bag. So for a large scale installation, I'm, again, I'm not um, thinking we should be doing this all on site. I'm thinking we should definitely be doing some of these things beforehand. Um, spray them with water. So you need one of these guys. And then when you put it in the airtight container, um, the water is being forced through the surface of the petals, stems, and leaves through the stoma. So mostly through the stems and leaves, but there are, there are pores in the petals as well. So you've allowed it to hydrate through the stem, and now you're allowing it to hydrate through the surface from the outside in. And so you're boosting up the hydration in the materials so that they can perform a little bit longer. And I also make friends with things like marigold. So where's, where's full belly? Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, 
Marigold, not everybody loves the electric orange, but they should. I think they should, so um, think about that. But um, I'm always looking for things that I know perform well, things that are friendly to this style of design, things that will allow me to design sustainably and to make good friends with those things. And the other things are for the centerpieces, for the bouquets, you know, like all the sweet pea and the clematis and the lilac and the, all those goodies. They go somewhere else and they have fun in the water. These guys have fun without the water. So I designed uh, most of these marigolds in this structure yesterday at hmm, 12 p.m. So these guys have not had a water source since then, and they look great. Um, just making friends with marigold, testing it, getting to know how it works, I know that it's a reliable flower. And there's so many reliable flowers. So think about the freedom of designing whatever shape and whatever form you want with a chicken wire and then pulling in materials like this that you know will allow you to do that uh, with low waste. <sighs> Any questions? No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, would you section that out, or would you create the whole thing? The question is, if you're creating the day before, and you have a large thing to create, like a 10-foot um, C-shaped installation, would you design it the day before, or in pieces? Yeah, would you create the whole thing with your wire technique? Yeah, it depends on what kind of van you have. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, so definitely. Um, I'll make you know arch arch pieces that are kind of C-shaped. You know, like Max said, you you often do like a flourish on the left and something low to the right, and that's kind of like an arch, a common arch thing. So I'll do a big C-shaped piece the day before, and I'll design it out like 70% of the way with the things I just mentioned. So I would definitely do marigolds the day before. I would do the safflower the day before. Definitely citrus. Um, Yarrow, but cut short because yarrow is a, a tricky one. It likes to wilt even though it's really rigid. You got to cut it short. So you start to make friends with the materials. Um, choose ones that you can do the day before and then attach it. So you might attach it to the wall of your van so you have ground space for the rest of your stuff. You might, yeah, yeah, just like make friends with all of the surfaces of your van. <laughs> and like the ladder goes up here, the installations are, you know, attached to the wall. Yeah, get to know all of those nooks and crannies. There's, a lot, there's lots of little points. Yeah, but I say do as much as you can ahead of time for certain. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk more about the connection to the ceiling. Yeah. Like, what is the mechanics part sure. for, for that? Yeah, the question. Yeah, definitely. So I'm a very simple person. Um, you certainly can get fancier, but um, this is Oasis Rustic Wire. It's extremely strong. It's really easy to twist shut when you're in a rush. Um, it's like a bark-covered wire that's very strong and can hold a lot of weight. So for this installation, I did like these hanging pendants of chicken wire. And so what I did was I just simply fed the rustic wire through the chicken wire like this, poked out the other side. And then I got up on the ladder and I chose a slat that had a good, you know, joist in it and I hung from there. Simple as that. If you need to do something more, like this is a very forgiving structure, you know, but you can use like airline cable, um, you can use really heavy fish line for, for some things if you need it to kind of float in midair. Yeah. Do you, ha like, y are you asking if you have a ceiling, like in a event space, that you need to? Yeah, it doesn't have flat. Yeah, it doesn't have flat. Mm hmm Yeah, well, you have to um, visit the venue and see what the hanging points are. Again, I'm very simple, so if it does look complicated, I'm looking for, like, you know, the tent guys to help me out. Because I'm not getting up on, yeah. No, I keep it kind of simple. But, yeah, there's all sorts of ways but um, most venues will tell you what's allowed and what's not. And you know, typically there's been events before where they've hung things so they can give you an idea of what's possible. Yeah, with the limitations of the space. Yeah. Uh, going back to the hydration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the pieces for um, large scale, if you want to do them ahead of time and you definitely need to, to cover them, um, I don't always cover them. So if I'm just doing, let's say I have a big C-shaped um, ground structure and I'm using like live oak, I would just design that completely, um, spray it with water, chuck it in the cooler, or just chuck it somewhere cool if you don't have a cooler, um, and then um, you know the rest could be done later. If I'm doing things like the marigolds and the yarrow, I would design it, spray it liberally, and then take a contractor bag and just slide it into the contractor bag and then shut the contractor bag and spray the inside of the bag too. Yeah, question, yeah. Yeah. How do you start preparing it? I have a terrible time with yarrow. Yeah, with it wilting? With it wilting, I use quick dip, I mm -hmm. do everything, but you said you cut it short? I do, yeah. Yep. So what I did yesterday, I cut it like about there. And how do you hydrate it? Um, it came hydrated from the grower. Do, do you guys have any insight? Harvesting yarrow? I Mm -hmm. Yellow yarrow, so yeah. yarrow, oftentimes the flowers will end up wilting a lot faster. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yarrow needs to be harvested almost when it's pollinated. When it's pollinated, like hellebore? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. So um, another thing about wilting, so you can use things that wilt, like amaranthus, hanging amaranthus. What I do with hanging, or, or this isn't hanging amaranthus, but you guys are with me. I'll, att I'll attach it into the installation already in a downward fashion. I'm not going to force anything upright that I know will take a turn during, you know, performance time. So, uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, that can happen sometimes. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, but the cottage yarrow, like I can tell, I can tell <laughs> looking at it that it is a little bit softer. So I want the color. It's not that this is the focal flower. This is like behind the scenes and the focal flowers will float forward. So I'm going to use this guy thinking behind, you know, in the back of my head thinking it could go down a little bit, um, but it's going to be a little bit tucked in. And then my more special flowers um, will float forward of this um, layer, if you will. So, um, yeah, so what else do I want to say about that? What I want to say, so after you decide, um, you know, the limitations of your space and like what you're trying to do, um, I'll kind of talk through what I, what I thought yesterday. So this pergola is really huge <laughs> and there's a lot of people here. So I was thinking, how can I create a little bit more of an intimate um, space? How can I bring in the edges a little bit? So instead of like designing on the legs of the pergola, which was my original kind of like, you know, thought, um, I thought, well, I'm going to hang some pieces and bring, bring them together a little bit more. So I have this little one that's coming kind of out towards the eye. This is my larger piece. Um, as Max said, like, you know, hanging out on the left side of things. Yep. And then <clears throat> this is a little compart, uh, partner piece kind of behind. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make your eyes go here first and see this like this big this big daddy and then his little friend here and then I want your eyes to go back here to see the third one. So the idea is I'm creating this dynamic visual flow where you you see the scene and your eyes are moving throughout. Again with each color and floral layer I'm doing the same thing. So I'll allocate the largest serving size of marigold and, and color here. And then I'll go here, a little bit of a medium serving size. And then I'll go there, a little bit of a smaller serving size. This kind of way of thinking, this terminology is, is Gregor Lersch's way of explaining um, the golden ratio. So it's kind of what Max was talking about. How do you create a dynamic visual flow through um, through a painting, through a floral design, through a dance performance, through a song. Um, the golden ratio is a way of describing um, natural patterns, patterns found in nature, proportion, color allocation, uh, visual flow. So if you guys are down with the golden ratio and you have the terminology 358, you familiar? Yeah? So this would be my eight piece, my largest piece. 
this would be my three, because three and eight hang out together, and then five here. So I'm deliberately borrowing from the way nature uh, allocates proportion. I'm using that as an influence, and I'm not creating symmetrical, static, um, floral compositions. I'm attempting <laughs> to borrow nature's um, way of, of allocating proportion, and then I'm using that in every element. So I've made a very deliberate choice to make the biggest one here, the smallest one here, and the medium size there. And then I'll do everything the same way with each floral layer. Any questions about that guy? Yeah. Uh, that was entirely new to me. Uh, can you just explain a little bit more about the 3.5.8? Yeah, yeah. How is that an 8, I guess? <laughs> it's an 8. <laughs> so um, the golden ratio is a mathematical representation um, that explains how nature, how proportions are found in nature. So it's, it's a ratio 1 to 1 1.6, blah, 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 blah. And if you take um, a little section out of that, 358 um, comes from that long mathematical um, relationship of proportion. I'm not explaining that part very well, but the 3, the 5, and the 8 are, are ways of thinking about how to allocate um, size, how to distribute color, um, so that you're, you're borrowing from this natural kind of always getting larger, always like, like oh gosh, <laughs> I'm getting tripped up. Like a nautilus shell. Yeah, like a nautilus shell. Yeah. So like the, you're not counting eight things. No, it's an it's a eight. It's like a largest serving size and a medium serving size and a smaller serving size of a given material within a composition. Yeah. I didn't explain that well. <laughs> yeah. So, so the floral layers that I work with, um, what I typically do is start with a structural layer, and then I go in with a lime flower, like a, like a snapdragon or a larkspur or something that's appreciated best from the side, and I lay that into my structural layer. And then I'll go in and add my lowest kind of color layers. And then I'll start working forward of that. Within each layer, there's, there's space. Because I want a lot of depth. I want each floral layer to be able to be viewed. Um, and so air between each layer is also a consideration. So let's just do a little, a little demo of that. So I'll go in with some yarrow, pretty deep. Can you guys see? I'm doing it all? Kind of. Yep. Keeping in mind the limitations of the yarrow. So that'll go in first. And then I'll think, what do I want to fly forward of the yarrow? And then I'll think, thing I want to fly forward, does it have a reliable stem or not? Or do I need to boost the stem up? So like I said, marigolds are one of my friends because even though their stems are hollow, they are quite reliable and leathery. So I'll clean off the greenery because I know that will wilt. And then I am designing right through the yarrow, but leaving a few inches so the yarrow can be seen and the flowers can be viewed too. I don't want anything at the same plane. I want everything to have its own level in the design so that when the eye goes through, just as the eye travels from this big one to this little one to that one and back through around and around, I want the eye to go through and see all of the relationships that I've tried to create. I have to stand back and see if I've done it. But um, there should be you know, a, a larger serving size of orange here, a little pause. And then I'll start another slightly smaller serving size of orange somewhere else in the piece, then another pause, and then another serving size. So again, with the 358, you know, within each piece, I'm trying to choose three primary focal areas where I'll concentrate floral interest. And then each of those areas gets 
deliberately gets an uneven serving size of that so that it doesn't feel like the human hand is controlling too much. It's borrowing from how nature um, naturally organizes proportion. So I'll give you an example. So um, think about like a, a wedding huppa or pergola or arch. You know those arrangements where there's like a blop here, a blop there, and then a blop in the middle, and they're all the same size. There might be some tool or something connecting them but they're all round, they're all the same size, they're all symmetrical. It's very contrived, it's very, there's not much for the eye to do, it's very static. So you see the arrangement, it has impact, like formal gardens will do like symmetrical design for the impact, but the visual flow is impeded because you look at the piece and there's not much for the eye to do. It observes these three you, you know, uniform blobs uh, typically of hydrangea, <laughs> and there's nothing else for it to do. But if you have, you know, a piece on the side that's a little bit larger, and then there's an empty pause moment, and then a little bit smaller, and then you cross down, and there's, you know, a medium kind of size, you look at the piece, and your eye goes around in this spiral from small to medium to large, like that. Um, so it's much more interesting, it's much more dynamic. Um, not as contrived. Does that help? I really botched the 358. I was getting so good at talking about it in person. And then sometimes you gotta like study a little bit more than you think before you start speaking. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, I do, okay, so I have a book and I do have a section in that in the book. And it's written in, and it makes sense. It's in order. <laughs> All right. So another thing I wanna say, um, I stuffed these burritos with a dead boxwood tree that we found um, that the grounds um, horticulturists had cleared. So that was a perfect stuffing because it will never um, break down. You know, I can use it again and again and again. But also it's nice and rigid and it's also this kind of blonde coppery color that made sense with the rest of my materials. So I'm always thinking about like what, what colors do I want to um, focus on? and then I don't want to detract from that. So I don't want to use a lot of dark green or a lot of like, you know, the leathery oak. It's so beautiful, but it's not, it's not um, reinforcing the color palette I chose. So I chose the blonde for that. And then I also chose to add some to the outside of the structure so that I can add things like these zinnia that over time, you know, this hollow stem can fail, but I can boost this guy with that stiff boxwood. So it becomes a little zinnia holder. So that if the zinnia does start to go down through the length of the event, it has a little neck holder. Does that make sense? So you can think about that too. And you could set in your little boxwood or little rigid um, materials in your focal areas so that you have this this matrix inside the chicken wire to add things to, but also these supports. So you can add things in that need a little more boosting um, with, a little more, uh, with you know, a little more security. These are really pretty, these zinnia. zinnia. And if you're not a florist and you haven't already left, <laughs> um, if you're not a florist and you're not interested in being a florist, you can still use these ideas in your garden. So you could create a structure with chicken wire and stem scraps, you know. Um, you can have it climb up your house. You can have it line a fence. You can have it um, on the ground. You can train things to run across it. And you have this, this nice, full um, form to work from to train your plants on and just create all sorts of amazing things. You could have like a swirly dynamic line going across your whole yard and train something to grow there. You can plant succulents in them. Um, you can do all sorts of things with them. But you should be interested in being a florist because it's really great. <laughs> so at least entertain that thought. Do you find that you continue spraying it as you're installing or it's not 
Um, so yesterday when I was done, I gave it a nice douse. And then this morning, I filled up those big water tubes. They were about half empty. The Abelia had, you know, had something to drink last night. So um, I typically don't spray during, you know, installation, just when I'm done. Uh, yesterday at like noon. Yeah, yeah. So it was hot yesterday. It'll be hot today, but I knew that it would cool down overnight dramatically, and I knew that I would get some of that lovely mist you all have here, um, which is like nature's hydration chamber. Um, but I also knew that that the marigolds. You see how how I'm having a hard time getting in here. It's like a really stiff design medium this matrix of stems, um, I knew that the materials I chose would be OK. Yeah. These were not like These guys? Yeah. No, no. So typically, the hydration chamber, um, I talk about it a lot, but it's mostly for wearables. So my way of thinking about it is it's, it's meant for any materials that will be displayed without a water source. So think cake flowers. Um, corsages, crowns, boutonnieres, wired bouquets, wired work, things like that. Um, large scale installation, you can boost things in the hydration chamber, like um, standard roses, marigolds, orchids, um, carnations, and then you can take them to the event in a Tupperware container, like big Tupperwares, instead of lugging a million buckets. So you can do it that way, or you can also make, you know, your installation in pieces, um, spray them, cover them with plastic, and then use the hydration chamber for larger things too. Yeah, but I don't chamber everything. <laughs> yeah. Question about work materials, like everything you use that you reuse. Yeah. Is there any particular concern about sanitation? Sanitation? Yeah, so the question is, is there, um, worry about reusing things and having them have bacteria and so on in them. Um, not the burritos, because I don't, I don't wait too long to clean up the burritos. So after the event, um, I, I usually, when I was doing weddings, I would pick up the next day when I could, you know, so that I could have um, a weekend. But uh, so I would probably clean up on a Sunday afternoon or maybe a Monday if uh, I'm really stretching it. And so the things in the, in the burrito, you know, they typically aren't rotting and, you know, contributing like a lot of mush or anything to the burritos. So the burritos I feel fine with. The water tubes, I do use bleach water. Yeah. You don't have to use bleach, but I like bleach. <laughs> I do. Are you, if you were going to price this for a wedding, would you just say the floral installation and then you know that they are going to be different pieces? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think they need to know. The question is, would you break this down for a client and say, for for your eight piece, it's going to be <laughs> three thousand. For your five, for your three, um, no, I don't. I would just say, I would describe it, be as descriptive as I can be. You know, an arcing pendant cluster or whatever you want to call it, um, and then give one price for the whole thing. Do you do you uh, charge for a site visit as well? Yeah, I think you probably should. Or, you know, you should just have enough in your, in your like, design fee um, to account for that kind of thing. Yeah, so I'll do, um, you know, my floral markup and then the labor that it costs to make the things while they're with you in the studio. And then there's a separate cost for the setup and for the time and the labor and everything that you have to do outside of the studio. So, yeah. The uh, question is, are you prepping the day before the so flowers? The flower tubes, the, like, are you pre-making bouquets into the florals? Like you can make, um, if you're using the EcoFresh wraps, you can make those the day before. The water tubes, I don't usually um, do the day before because the stuff drinks so much, you got to fill them up anyway. So I'll fill the water tubes, have them in a bucket ready to go, and then I'll have someone, I'll be on the ladder and I'll have someone handing me tube stuff. And the large water tubes, I should mention, don't fit into the hex of the chicken wire burritos. So you have to have a little clipper, and you clip out a few of the little hex 
dealies, and then you tuck in your water tube like that. So another thing that's a common question is, well, what if I want it to hang upside down? Um, don't. <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> so what I try to do is focus on things that I know don't need the water where I am cascading, and then I don't have to be worried about upside down water tubes. Because if the water tube's upside down, then the air's here where the stem is hanging out. <laughs> so the stem's hanging out in air, the tip of the stem. Um, you, know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. Sue, I yeah. Have a, I have a question about the, the Holly Chapel. What is, it, what is that called exactly? I think it's called the Holly Chapel installation line for syndicate. I don't know if it has a little cute name like the toad or whatever. <laughs> and how would that be attached to, to your structure? Yeah, I would use probably bind wire or rustic wire, and I would have a little wire here and a little wire there, and then hang it in the installation like that, fill it with water, and then design my delicate things in there. And for arches, are you making them beautiful from all like sides? The question is, are you making arches beautiful from all sides? If the budget allows, if time allows, um, if a lot of people will be hanging out back there, which they shouldn't be, they should be hanging out over there. But the photographers always take that photo from like behind. I know. It's so silly. Yeah, so I don't focus floral, um, you know, attention on the back sides of things, really. I make sure it's green and finished and decent looking from all sides. Like I knew you guys would be sitting over there, so I put a little over here. But, um, Really, what I'm focused on is the face of the arrangements, and I think most people do because the budget usually doesn't allow for um, flowers to be everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, um, I didn't design anything y until I hung it up, this piece. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I worked layer by layer. I went, um, you know, first with my abelia, and I set in some of those tubes, and then I got down off the ladder, and I went and looked, and I'm like, is it okay? And then I came back, and I did the yarrow, deliberately like a big chunk here, a pause, another chunk, a pause, and another chunk. And then I went and looked, <laughs> and then I came back and did the marigolds. Um, these pieces aren't done, so the floral takeover, I'll be working on them. And if anybody wants to stay back and help me complete, they're welcome to. Um, I left them not completely done. But my, my hope when I'm completely done is that visual flow will be really apparent. Um, and the concentrations of things will make, will make good sense based on the golden ratio. Um, and I think I need more lemons, too. I think that as well. Yeah. And so, um, again, I think the success of this is setting yourself up with, re with reliable materials that will perform for your conditions. Everybody has different conditions. Um, and then working with the limitations of the material. So I know this is not something that should be designed without a water source, but I also know how long it needs to look good. And I know how fresh and nice this is and I know I'm hanging out in the shade. So I'm thinking about all of these factors when I'm making choices. Um, I wouldn't put something, you know, like a sweet pea vine, you know, without a water source. I'm just always thinking about what will perform for the needs of the event and how can I limit waste. And then those are the kind of the series of checks I go through when I'm deciding what to use. Any questions? Yeah. Um, the hops? The hops vine? Yeah. <laughs> um, the hops, I hung, and I have one here too, and one there. These are kind of like partner pendants, kind of filling the space and filling it out a little bit more. So I don't think I'm going to add flowers to them. I might add some hanging, up, hanging upside down marigolds um, into the installation just to pepper through a little, another little layer, like a little transparent layer of color. Um, but the hops will probably just stay green. Yeah. Yeah. Are you convinced your clients that it's going to look great with marigolds? Because like, marigolds are not like the first flower choice for mm -hmm. a lot of weddings. Yeah, 
the question is, how do you make people like marigolds? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I think with pushing any idea, you have to have like photos to show people so that they know that it is a good idea. You could also use white marigolds or like light yellow, you know. Um, it, all, it all depends on how fun your client is. <laughs> I know they don't like to have a lot of fun, so um, that is an issue. <laughs> it is an issue. But, um, you know, things like carnation, things like, um, Late season hydrangea, you know, the beautiful um, cone-shaped hydrangeas. Those are nice and hearty, and they're white, and, you know, they're wedding-y, and there's all sorts of materials you can use. It doesn't have to be orange. I know I took a little bold move, but I love, um, I love flowers like marigold. I'm trying to, to talk about things that I know are reliable, and um, being here in California, I just wanted something sunny and bright. So, But people are growing the white marigold now. Yeah. You do? Yeah. They're just as strong, right? Yeah. They mm -hmm. smell like vanilla. They smell like vanilla? Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Do you guys have any other questions? Um, how long do you allow yourself to make these? How long? How long? To make them? Um, as long as I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's another like factor in the whole recipe of what you're doing. What's the window like? What are the limitations of the venue? Some, you know, some venues are so ridiculous. You have like two hours to be in and out. So in that case, I would still sell something elaborate, but then I would make sure um, to charge the client enough to bring enough manpower on site to execute it, you know, quickly and reliably. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah, and then, you know, I time myself. So this is something that's kind of weird. Um, when I was newer, I really wanted to know, like, how much manpower do I need to hire for a given thing? How much time should this take? So I started timing myself, and I got faster and faster, of course, as I got more experience. But, like, I know how long it should take to make a centerpiece. And, you know, a table centerpiece, an elevated centerpiece, a bouquet, a corsage, a boutonniere. Like, I have those times in my mind. Um, because I did time myself for so many years. And yeah, not all freelancers are as fast as others, but you know, <laughs> you get like an idea of what you need to execute. Yeah. Was there another one? Yeah. What variety of Snapdragon? Madam Butterfly? Yeah, or Chantilly? Chantilly? Chantilly. Chantilly. <laughs> and I don't like the green tip, so I cut it off. I don't like it. There you go. <laughs> so, there. so there. Yeah. I hope this was helpful, you guys. I tried to give you as much like of the thoughts that go through my head. I know I didn't, I didn't take you from beginning to end, but you're welcome to come up. You're welcome to come look at the various stages of making that I've done here. And you're welcome to hang out and help me finish if you so desire. Wow, that was so great. So much great information. I'm so happy that I was able to share this with you today. I just looked up a quote from Sue from the first profile I published about her in 2017. It was for a story in Florist Review Magazine. We called it A Curious Creative. And you heard how she spoke about curiosity uh, being a you know, real indicator that you're onto something. This is what she said in her quote. You have to be insanely curious and you have to keep your curiosity. Rather than waiting for the muse to miraculously appear, Sue is ever attentive and observant, seeking inspiration from many sources. She continues, the life of a florist is very busy and there isn't a lot of free time. But my advice is to make creativity and creative time a priority. Schedule a day or part of a day each month and try out new ideas. Create just for yourself. Make things that you want to make and be sure to have them photographed. Make it a priority. Well. That is such great advice, and her work really speaks for her constant striving for creativity, and I hope it inspires you. You can watch the replay video of this show at soulflowerspodcast.com for episode 562, and there you'll also find links and more resources to Sue's beautiful platform of resources and education for flower lovers. Before I go, I'd like to thank our sponsors who bring this show to you. 
This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 850 florists, shops, and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S. grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. And thank you to Cal Flowers, the leading floral trade association in California, pro- providing valuable transportation and other benefits to flower growers and the entire floral supply chain in California and 48 other states. The association is a leader in bringing fresh cut flowers to the U.S. market and in promoting the benefits of flowers to new generations of American consumers. And thank you to Storic Cold, creators of the revolutionary CoolBot, a popular solution for flower farmers, studio florists, and farmer florists. Save thousands when you build your own walk-in cooler with the CoolBot system and an air conditioner. If you don't have time to build your own, they also have turnkey units available. Learn more at storeitcold.com. And thank you to the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Formed in 1988, the ASCFG was created to educate, unite, and support commercial cut flower growers. Its mission is to help growers produce high quality floral material and to foster and promote the local availability of that product. Learn more at ASCFG.org. The Slow Flower Show is a member-supported endeavor, and I value our loyal members and supporters. If you're new to our weekly show or our long-running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowersociety.com and consider making a donation to sustain Slow Flower's ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at slowflowerspodcast.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing host and producer of the Slow Flowers Show and the Slow Flowers Podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one vase at a time. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I'll see you next week.